G'day guys, it's Frank here, welcome. <laughs> Today's topic is going to be a tricky one. It's on Hebrews chapter 6. It is a bit of a hot spot. In fact, if you do a uh, search on commentaries on Hebrews chapter 6 alone, uh, you'll find and uh, everyone, all commentators will say it is a difficult, difficult passage. One of the hardest passages uh, to properly interpret. So here I am going to try and give you my my view on it my position is that you can never lose your salvation as a born-again believer and this is why I want to tackle it because I think a lot of this uh, interpretation is just my humble opinion uh, even from scholars uh, that they're all got it sort of wrong or a lot of them got it wrong uh, and so instead of being an intimidating passage because really when you think about it uh, According to Hebrews chapter 6, it says there in verse 4, For it is impossible for those who have once been once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, etc., etc., if they fall away, to renew again to repentance. So basically, if, um, in effect, it's what it's saying is if you've actually uh, become a believer, that's how a lot of people interpret it, then, and you, I don't know, sin, I guess, um, that there is no way you can come back. So it's almost like a death sentence. That means you can lose your salvation, totally lose your salvation. This is how it's interpreted, right? And never come back. No matter what you say to God. No matter if you get on your knees and cry. Is that true? Well, a lot of people say, no, it isn't. But that's how that in, is interpreted. Because it, it is saying there's a, it's impossible. And... That word impossible is the same word where the word impossible um, is used where it says it's impossible for God to lie. So we know, we know what that means, don't we? Impossible for God to, not, to lie. Well, that's the same word. That's what it means. It means what it means. But so is that true? And this is where these terms, you know, um, loss of salvation, which is not scriptural, and once saved, always saved is not scriptural, though that in that the language is not used. But however, I believe that really, if you are saved, you can't lose your salvation. And I, I believe that's what this passage is saying. But at the same time, it is highlighting something, a, a, a warning, if you like, for, a, for a, a particular group of people that if they don't believe they could lose their salvation or they could you know miss out altogether so what is it about um the best way to handle hebrews is look at the audience who is it written to first up so first up we realize that the book of hebrews is written to jews okay not to specific christians to it's specifically to Jewish Christians. Also within that group, there are, you know, because there's small church groups, if you can look, you know, visualize it, there would be people who are Jewish, but not believers, turning up, hearing them out. Here in Jerusalem, you've got some of the best speakers, uh, you've got some of the strong apostles out there, performing all sorts of work. So no doubt, a lot of Jews would have been interested in hearing what these uh, Jewish converts now who are Christians have to say about Jesus. Because they're, they're watching, they're seeing all this uh, incredible works taking place. So we can say there's an interested group in there. There's the believers, the ones that have become uh, Christians, they're Jewish. And so this this writer writes the, the the writer to the Hebrews writes and he's trying to show the superiority of Jesus, highlighting who Jesus is and how he's far superior to the past, to all their things that are doing from the temple to the priest to the old covenant, how there's a new covenant in play, and how they can be partakers of it. But there's also warnings in there. And I think that's what we're seeing here in Hebrews chapter 6. It's a warning to unbelieving Jews. Now, you might think to yourself, which passage specifically am I referring to? It's this in verses, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. 
It says, and it, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the, of the powers of the ages to come. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to put him to an open shame. So there's that difficult passage. When you look at Hebrews, you, I, I guess it's good to go back a bit because this is sort of midway between chapters 1 to 13 or 12, right? So he's building up. This writer is building up to a point. And he's in between that. There are other warning examples. For example, in Hebrews... Uh, where is it? Hebrews chapter... I think it was 4. He said this, For we also had the <clears throat> good news proclaimed to us, <clears throat> excuse me, just as they did. But the message they heard was no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day let us therefore make every effort to enter the rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience so the israelites would get an image they know what he's saying if they go back into their history he uses the words that the good news was proclaimed to them as it was as it is proclaimed to us they did not share the faith of those who obeyed Right, so notice disobedience, obedience, he means faith. They did not go in because of their disobedience, for if Joshua had given them rest. So these people who perished in the wilderness, that's where the reference is, is because of their unbelief. They didn't believe, right? They didn't have faith. They didn't believe. They stood at the entrance of God's physical rest. Now notice how a lot of these um, terminology can be related in the past about partaking of the spirit about being enlightened etc now here's a couple of uh, pointers just so we just it's because these guys these hebrews will understand what this writer is trying to say and this writer is building up he's taking them on a journey through the past to the present through the past this is what happened in the past this is where you are now almost parallels okay uh, this is where they witnessed the they had the column of the cloud in the day and a bright fire in the night uh, the brightness of his glory of Mount Sinai the fire consumed we know the rebels the Hebrews saw his light they were enlightened um, let me see where else I've got my other passage they were enlightened yes they were <laughs> They ate the daily bread, right? The manna they, that he provided. The Hebrews tasted, in other words, that heavenly gift given to the heaven to know that the word of God, the Holy Spirit rested on Moses um, so that he could judge the people as well. And later Moses, remember, he shared that with 70 others. And the 70 others also then received the spirit or the Spirit uh, fell upon them, so therefore they shared, and therefore helped them carry that burden um, in sharing with the Holy Spirit. And so we know that the Spirit also then fell on other kings and prophets. Today's believers, we don't have that happen to us. We actually get possessed, or the Spirit possesses us. We get an indwelling of the Spirit. John fourteen sixteen. Uh, they saw supernatural events, right, that occurred before their eyes, like the parting of the Red Sea, for example, uh, where they escaped. Uh, the, mir the, the miracles were physical demonstrations of something yet to come, the age to come. So we, we didn't see that. So that's why we know that this couldn't be us, because we... 
in verse 5, it says, and the powers of the age to come. That hasn't happened for us. We, 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 have, we, we literally didn't see what the apostles have been doing in the past, right? So he's building up on this case. But even yet, and this is the point of uh, Hebrews 4, even though they've received all that, they've seen all that, they had all the blessings and the, the manna, etc., they were still stubborn right and they deliberately refused to go into the land that god had promised them the land to rest that is what is meaning by falling away you could also say that that is what it's meaning it is meaning what that by constantly rejecting jesus as their messiah um it is almost like what else could they do i mean these are you know what else what other what more can be told to these people so they could believe? They're being <clears throat> pushing away, pushing what, uh, what's been happening to them with Jesus. So this point of, so now let's bring it up. Okay, so now that's their history. We know that's their history. <clears throat> so now in Jerusalem, what's been happening since Pentecost, right? Um they would have heard the gospel every day about Jesus, these Jews. Even though they hear it every day, can that save them? No. And likewise, even today. Why? Because they must believe that Jesus has forgiven them of their sins. Sins. Once. Okay, so to be saved. Likewise, uh, in, so, in those churches there, these Jews heard all about Jesus from the best gospel teachers, Peter, James, John, etc. Some of them even walked with him. Many Hebrew unbelievers still wanted to go back to the Jewish temple, even though they heard all this, seen the, the miracles, raising of the dead, powerful works, healing, demon-possessed people being healed etc they just wanted to go back to the the temple to the bull uh, and and try to receive forgiveness by way of animal blood instead of Christ they refused to repent that is in their belief system and instead <clears throat> what they did was they hedged their bets on the works of the temple which which were now obsolete dead works, according to Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Let me read that to you. It says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary doctrines of Christ, let us go on perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, of laying of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So, this is what repenting means. Repenting means to do a 180 from your belief system to follow some another belief system, and that and this was Jesus. Now, so he's saying to them, "Hey, you you you're going back to the the dead works of of the past. It's not going to save you." They refuse to repent, <clears throat> and so they heard the gospel. They tasted it. They tested it. They've seen it. See, this is what it means to taste, test. They, it'd be like going to Costco, you know, and they, you know, you get those little taste testers or a shopping center. And they give you something on a toothpick. You know, they tried it out, but they failed to invest. Some people will try it, keep moving on. Well, these Jews tried it out. They went to these church groups. Uh, they heard, they seen, they all the powerful works. They've got their history as an example of where they failed. They had all the tasting and all the seeing and all the believing, but they still failed to fully believe because of their unbelief. Well, here they are again doing the same thing. You see that, yeah, sure, they, they're they seeing it. They're having a taste of it. They're even being enlightened to some degree. 
you know, by what they're hearing and seeing. And yet, um, if they go back to this dead work, which is now finished, the law is no longer in play. If they go back to that, it's dead. They're crucifying Jesus. You see, they already rejected him. So if they go back to that, that's what the writer's saying. Well, there's no more room for repentance. I mean, if that, you know, like, what else can you say to these guys? And that's what he's saying. They heard the gospel, tasted it, tested it. Were around people who were one with the Holy Spirit. So these Jewish believers, Christians, they had the Holy Spirit. The apostles had the Holy Spirit. But they still wanted to stick around with the traditions of Moses' commandments, therefore disgracing Jesus publicly. They tasted but wouldn't drink in the truth. And that's what those passages emphasize. Now, we know that the Christians, Jewish Christians, would have probably been freaking out hearing this passage. So guess what he says in verse 9? He says, but beloved. Notice, but beloved. That sounds different to these earlier passages, right? Earlier texts. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Notice that. So he's saying, hey, guys, don't freak out. <clears throat> okay, so we know, beloved, they're, they're the ones that are saved. We know that there is something accompanying things which are much better, stronger. But this strong, you know, warnings, if you like, needs to be said. They need to say something to these uh, Jewish folk who are just sitting on the fence who, uh, who aren't really putting faith and belief in Jesus as the Messiah. Remember, it's a Hebrew audience. They should know better. In fact, when you go through this whole book, the first 10 chapters, there's only one sin mentioned. Only one sin. It's not sin of immorality. None of that, because the Jews were very righteous. Do you know what that sin is? According to verse... Uh, as we mentioned there in Hebrews chapter 4, and then 6, and then in 10, we can do that another hot spot, willful sin. It's the sin of unbelief. It's only one sin ever mentioned. And it's this one sin. It gets them all the time. They need to believe in that Jesus is the Messiah. They need to repent and focus on Him. He is the only one that can save them out of this debacle. So these points that he mentions, I'll just quickly run through them. <clears throat> there are five things, just, just as a way of conclusion. Those who were once enlightened. Judaism had both the revelation of God through the prophets and through his son. That, okay, so they tasted of the heavenly gift. Uh, it could also mean a reference to Jesus sent from heaven to Israel. Not only in the past, but also now. Like in the manna, he's the bread, right? Food. Uh, made partakers of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> partakers does not need to mean that they were filled with the Spirit. Israel was a partaker of the Spirit in the Spirit in that the spirit came to jerusalem a city which became bewildered amazed and astonished according to acts chapter 2 67 and 12. when they saw what was happening they tasted the good word of god <clears throat> as with the heavenly gift this was more than hearing to a real experience of tasting tested to the of the powers well to come the miraculous works of the Gospels and the Pentecostal era were a display of the powers of the coming age, the Messianic age. They had experienced all that. We, we don't experience that. Christians today, we, we haven't experienced that. But they did. They had no excuse. That's what the writer is saying. Can these five claim, things be claimed by Christians today? Well, to some level... Maybe we can, right? At least five of the six could be claimed by Christians today. Although 
not in the manner in which Israel ever experienced them. Would you not agree? The final one, as I mentioned, is something we have is not something we have experienced except through reading it. It is, it is significant that there is nothing here that speaks of justification by faith, nor can it be implied. In short, the description is of someone who's not saved, and specifically to the Hebrews or to Israel, with no other people in history, in the history of man, having less excuse for not coming to Christ for salvation. Would you not agree? I mean, look at what everything that they've gone through. And yet, right? This is the point. And yet, <laughs> it's impossible for them, if they continue to reject the Messiah, it's impossible for them to ask for more repentance. I mean, what else? Can, you know, it'd be like that guy, in, uh, the people in Matthew chapter 7 saying, Lord, Lord, did we not do powerful works in your name? And then he'll say, I never knew you. You see, they didn't look to him. It's the same thing. If they shall fall away, because this is an active verb, it is not by accident or neglect that they fall away. Notice, it's an active verb. So therefore, it's not by accident nor neglect that they fall away. So Israel and those who were joining themselves in this church group experience five blessings which inexcusably bring them to the point of an impossible renewal should they walk away. The Greek words of it is impossible in verse 4 and 6, as I was saying, one long and grammatically difficult sentence, the King James Version has a closer rendering in the word order of the Greek than most modern translations. If that generation of Jews, having received all those things, five things they experienced, were to walk away from Jesus as the Christ, they would have no refuge at all. In the Hebrew context, the city of refuge was for those who accidentally or inadvertently killed someone. The generations of the Jews killed out of ignorance, Acts 3.17. However, now they have had this ignorance revealed. So if they walk away now, they crucify to themselves the Son of God and therefore will have no, will have no such refuge to go to. So friends, what do we conclude? We're concluding this. This is what I'm concluding. That you cannot, it's not about you losing, me losing our salvation. Not at all. It is really specifically looking to these Jews, these unbelieving Jews sitting on the fence. This is what this passage is about. But the truth is about this book also is that it's, it's meant to build confidence in the power of Jesus Christ. Not cause believers to shake in our boots. And that's what a lot of people try to do. Put the fear of life into you. They try to control and manipulate you, friend. Uh, by using these passages to scare you out of your salvation, which is impossible. You can't lose it once you're a believer. We are united union in union with Christ. That means if we are to lose our salvation for some reason, somehow God can destroy us, that means he must kill Jesus as well. Or Jesus has to lose his uh, salvation or his life, which is impossible. Because we are linked to Jesus. We are, yet, we, we are alive because of Jesus. So if we are to die, then Christ would die as well again. Which doesn't make sense. So no, it's not, it's not there to cause believers to shake in our boots. There are zero threats for Christians in this writing, nor in any book of the Bible. The only threats are directed toward those who reject faith. In the Messiah. And that is, of course, in this context, it was talking to the Hebrews, the Jewish Hebrews who were joining in with the, the believing Jews, but were also wanting to go back to the temple, you know, hedging their bets there, trying to work their way back into the good books with Jesus, with God. 
the only way you can get your good, you know, be in the good books with God is to put faith in Jesus, faith in the, in the Messiah. It is impossible for a Christian to do this because we've already been born again, as I was saying. And our new natural, supernatural birth is final. We can't reject being born because Jesus would have to die again. And that's not happening. And if you want to see some references, Hebrews 1.3 Hebrews 7, 24 to 25, John chapter 1, 12 and 13, John chapter 3, 6 and 7, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 13. As it says in verse 9, Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. So, take comfort, friend. Um, thanks for listening. I hope that's helped you. If you want me to, I might tackle on Hebrews chapter 10 for you as well, the willful sin. Again, it's in context all throughout Hebrews. One sin is only mentioned, and that is of unbelief. But in this passage, I hope that's helped you. As I said, look, there are many people who say it's too difficult. A lot of commentaries and scholars who so you can lose your salvation you can't the christians can christians can't but you know maybe immature christians can whatever look at the context who is it talking to it's not talking to us it doesn't mean that and this is the thing i want to say doesn't mean just because we i'm saying you, you can't lose your salvation it is an excuse for sinning it's not an excuse for sinning no we're children of god why would you want to go out and sin? We, we've got a new birth. We're a new creation, right? So it, it is false to think that. Just because we've guaranteed and assured of our salvation, it doesn't make it a reason or an excuse to, to go out and sinning, nor is it a license to sin. So I just wanted to make that clear. Thanks for listening. I hope that's helped you. Please leave a comment. If you disagree with me anyway, that's fine. As I said to you, a lot of people... Uh, either or you know so if you want to leave a comment and explain to me why you believe you can lose your salvation according to this text use some scriptures and uh, you know let's let's ever hear what you got to say more than happy to but for me that's how i read it and i'm quite satisfied in that in my my personal view of course i've got to be but i'm quite satisfied that that's what it's actually saying it's not to directed to believers it is directed to jewish people who understood everything and yet were sitting on the fence or were not really putting their faith or not putting their faith in jesus they're still going back to their dead works as hebrews 6 1 and 2 says instead of moving forward in their journey as a and, and becoming fully fledged believers in christ thanks again guys and have a great week talk to you next week see you later